we very much want to ensure that the increase of owner operators that have been fortunate to grow through the last two years con continue to be able to see that growth um, and or be able to have more optionality of what growth can look like into the future. The voice you heard up top was that of Arrive Logistics Chief Strategy Officer Jan Teo talking about the broker 3PL's We Deliver Flexibility program, now getting its footing as a connection engine between independent owner operators and small fleets in Arrive's network and larger private fleets the company also does business with. I'm Todd Dills, your host for this edition of Overdrive Radio for July 29th, 2022. It is my colleague Matt Cole's interview with Jan Teo from Arrive that we'll be featuring first in today's edition. The ARRIVE program, as T.O. noted, hopes to alleviate issues on both sides of the coin. For owner operators watching the deflationary rates environment and spot market, and for private fleets needing safe and professional capacity, it could well be a way into new opportunities for owners both inside and outside of ARRIVE's network, as T.O. describes it. A way to develop new contracts for freight with large clients who might typically not have much of an interest in doing business with the very small fleets. So keep tuned. There's more in today's episode though, too. We're going to hear from our own long haul Paul Marhofer's moving eulogy for Ken Shoestring Waugh, part of our over the road collaboration with PRX's Radiotopia podcast network. And we'll catch the latest from trucker songwriter extraordinaire Tony Justice. Justice delivered a big check to the Susan G. Komen Foundation for Breast Cancer Awareness and Research this Monday in Nashville. Hey everybody, we're downtown Nashville, Tennessee, uh, in front of the Country Music Hall of Fame. And uh, on behalf of Large Cars and Guitars and Fifth Wheel Records, uh, we're honored to present this check for $33,085. Uh, this money was raised at the Large Cars and Guitars Truck Show in Kodak, Tennessee. I want to send a huge shout out to all my brothers and sisters of the highway who came out to the truck show even during and amidst high fuel prices, low rates, and still took a few days off to help support the cause. This would not uh, be possible uh, without them. So uh, thanks thanks to all those uh, truck drivers who took the time to come out and support the cause. And uh, it's uh, the honor of my life to uh, present this check to uh, Karen with uh, Susan G. Coleman. And uh, thank you guys for everything you do to help, help fight the battle against breast cancer. Uh, my wife uh, went Went through uh, in 2019 her battle with breast cancer and come out victorious on the other side. And uh, we're very grateful. And uh, so this is uh, also something that we did uh, just to kind of honor her and her battle as well. So we are very privileged to, to begin to do this. And thank you guys for everything you do. Thank you. And we certainly appreciate um, your partnership with Susan G. Coleman as well. Um, things have gone well over the last few years. Coleman, over the last 40 years, has reduced breast cancer mortality by 42% from 1989 to 2019. Um, but there is still much work to be done and partnerships such as these make a huge difference. Um, breast cancer is still the leading cause of cancer in women worldwide and the second leading cause of breast cancer deaths in women in the U.S. Our second leading cancer deaths, um, breast cancer being it, um, the second leading. Um, in 2022, it's expected that 44,000 women and men will um, die as a result of breast cancer. So there's a lot to be done and donations such as this really help with innovative breakthrough research um, that can make a difference in treatment options and such. Um, additionally, it helps um, put people together with resources in their local community. So getting through any barriers to treatment there might be and putting them in touch with um, screening and diagnostic options, treatment assistance programs and such. So we really appreciate it. There's much more to do and um, we will continue to work for a world without breast cancer, which is our um, main goal. And we thank you so much for your time and, and donation and partnership. We, we hope this helps. We look forward to doing it again next year. Thank you so much for your time and God bless. And after that presentation by Justice and Moffler out front of the Country Music Hall of Fame, we walked inside for a sit-down talk with Justice about all the money raised by the more than 100 owner-operators, small fleet owners, show vendors, and more who participated in the first ever Large Cars and Guitars Truck Show in Kodak, Tennessee, back in May. And there's a bonus in that conversation, too. Team Justice has big things planned for the new year. But first, let's dive in with Arrive Logistics and Overdrive News Editor Matt Cole. 
Here's Jan Teo setting up the discussion of the We Deliver Flexibility program, connecting independents and private fleets. Absolutely. So Arrive Logistics, we're a multimodal transportation technology company. We're based out of Austin and actually celebrating our eight year anniversary in a few weeks here. Um, we have about 1500 employees. We have our Austin office as well as Chicago. Uh, we are excited to expand into San Antonio, which will be opening up actually next week and then have Tampa opening by the end of the year. Um, we focus mainly on truckload, but we also have LTL, um, uh, intermodal cross-border services. And so really we've been following the pace of our, our customers and their needs. So for the We Deliver Flexibility program, it was a purpose-driven pilot program that we launched based on the feedback from our carrier network. So whether that was an owner operator, small fleet or a private fleet, from their feedback, we noticed that there was commonality in some of their needs. Um, and so from even the current events of the deflationary market that our owner operators are feeling right now, as well as the challenges from the private fleet lens of driver recruitment, retention, and equipment, we felt it was part of our responsibility to be able to be connectors and ensuring that they shared um, mutual challenges and see if there was mutual benefits. So for the owner operator and small fleet space, actually pretty early on in our early stages of just discovery and research, we sent a survey out to a small subset of our owner operators within our network. And we were overwhelmed by the response. We had a few hundred owner operators reach out almost instantly and just share that they'd be interested in learning more. And so that was the first uh, indicator to the Arrive team that we might be on to something here and this actually could be beneficial to both communities. Um, and then reaching out to our private fleets, we've already been fortunate to onboard some pretty notable, large, uh, well-known brand private fleets onto the program. And so we took action relatively quickly to A, ensure that people knew that this was a program that would exist, uh, but B, based on their feedback, really try to follow the lead of our carrier partners in understanding how best to connect and what information was necessary so that they could take it upon themselves to take the next steps as far as what uh, would be best in, far, in some sort of partnership. You know, kind of looking at it from the owner operator side, you know, what are some of the benefits to owner operators? How do they get involved in the program? What's the vetting process? From the owner operator perspective, right now we have an active survey to anyone who's been active in an Arrives Network and we've reached out to owner operators or small fleets under five power units and have an active link where people can fill out their forms and read some frequently asked questions from both the owner operator as well as private fleet space about the program. Um, and from there, not only do they submit in their um, interest in being able to be active in the program, but also on top of that too, we start working as connect connectors between the private fleets that are onboarded um, and really, really promote them taking it upon themselves as far as what the next steps would be. Um, this is an active pilot program. And so we are also touching base with our private fleets pretty regularly to better understand if they are getting the correct information they need, as well as how do we iterate on the program to make sure that it's fully flushed in, in the future. For the owner operators, are these, um, you know, when they, when they find a private fleet to kind of partner with, are these one-time load opportunities? Are they signing freight contracts? How what uh, what is the process like when they when they kind of find a partner in this in the system? Our commitment is basically just ensuring that we're having conversations with the private fleets to be able to flush out the opportunities that they can present to the owner operators that they're interested in. Um, so, with that said, a lot of the opportunities do have wide ranges, and will be based on both the private fleet and also the individual owner operator to make the decision on whether or not it's best for him or her. For private fleets, a lot of it has been very communicative and almost fluid conversation as far as what the needs of that private fleet would be, both in increased driver needs or just overall capacity. And so part of our mission and our conversations with those private fleets is to better understand where else we should be surveying our owner operator um, network, if that's of interest. But mainly, especially in these exploratory stages, we've been just keeping in good cadence with some of our most notable or um, relationship strong private fleets over the last few years, um, because we also want to ensure that this is a good experience for the owner operator. So um, without getting too expansive in our private fleets that are part of this program, we're making sure that we have close ties with those who are involved so that we can make sure that before we get into a larger expansive program, that this is fully flushed. We're absolutely open to being able to provide solutions to owner operators, whether they are or not part of our network. 
We do have the active both TNCs as well as platform links, so people are able to sign up. Um, again, we want to make sure that this is mutually beneficial for both parties, and so we'll make sure to do uh, pass on information to our private fleets um, for what people are willing to give us, and then from there be able to have our private fleets do the majority of the vetting um, when it comes to what owner operators they want to approach. Do you have a, a sense of what kind of information um, is usually asked of the owner operators, just to kind of give them a sense of um, you know, information they should, uh, you know, have on hand to bring to the table, so to speak. Mainly their MC number, anything that they feel comfortable with um, being able to share is going to be, again, best preferred method of contact for when private fleets do reach out to them. Um, all of it is going to be right at the forefront of that platform uh, link. And so for an owner operator, if they're not comfortable sharing that information, um, it'll be very transparent as to what they're asked to share and if it's public, public domain. In the system, the private fleets are the ones that are kind of initiating the contact between the two parties uh, instead of the other way around. In this initial stage for the pilot, uh, our private fleets will be reaching out to owner operators, um, mainly based on uh, where the needs of their businesses are and or what their freight needs are. Um, but as we expand this program, that's the type of feedback that we absolutely want from both parties to better understand how we iterate in the future. How long do you expect the pilot program to last? Or is there a certain time frame that you're looking to, to continue it through? And, um, you know, what are the next steps after that? Right now, we've actually been very pleased with the amount of interest from both private fleets, um, private fleets as well as owner operators. Uh, as a team, we plan on huddling both with the private fleets as well as the most active owner operators that have provided us the most feedback on the program. And so um, we look to be able to explore that further with those two different forum groups and better understand what kind of platforms or iterations of platforms we need to build in the future. Um, the principles for Arrive have always been very simple about being able to facilitate the ease of doing business across all of our partners. And so based on their feedback, if we believe that this is truly beneficial, even to a few owner operators or a few private fleets, it's something we'll continue to explore. I think that more than anything, what I want to reiterate is this is a feedback purpose driven program. And so although this is our first pilot, when it comes to we deliver flexibility, we're very interested in understanding how we can make this a mutually beneficial program for our private fleets and owner operators uh, with the current market state today and into the foreseeable few quarters. We very much want to ensure that the increase of owner operators that have been fortunate to grow through the last two years can continue to be able to see that growth um, and or be able to have more optionality of what growth can look like into the future. Here's a big thanks to Jan Teo for her time. You can explore Arrive Logistics' new We Deliver Flexibility Owner Operator to Private Fleet Connection Engine via a link you'll find in the show notes for this podcast or via the post that houses it for July 29th, 2022 at overdriveonline.com slash overdrive hyphen radio. Now on to that conversation I had with Tony and Misty Justice at the Country Music Hall of Fame. It's been quite a year thus far for the pair, as you'll hear. Here's Tony speaking to the source of the big $33,000 plus haul for the Susan G. Coleman Foundation raised at Large Cars and Guitars in May. Uh, at the truck show, we raised money. Uh, we, we donated 100% of the truck registration funds, 100% of the vendor fees. So anybody wanted to set up selling? And uh, we did an auction. We donated 100% of the auction. And then we had a uh, personal donation from a family that was uh, I can't remember. The Mann family, Justice is talking about there, owners of White Pine Paving, showing two rigs at Large Cars and Guitars. Visit our custom rigs section on overdriveonline.com for a look at their 2000 Kenworth Day Cab change order, most recently, and the Breast Cancer Awareness Dump Truck Ribbon Runner, both elaborately customized rigs from a dedicated family business. So uh, we had a personal donation uh, uh, from the Mann family, White yeah. Pine Paving with the pink dump truck uh, for $1,500, which was awesome. Yeah. Uh, we didn't expect that. And then we had uh, a team. Uh, the wife had made uh, some little pink ribbons and was just, uh, just, she made like 20 of them or something. And she was just going around and people wanted to make a donation for one. And she raised $2,100 yeah. with those ribbons. Yeah, it was crazy. And she's like, we got a surprise for you. Like, well, hey, you know, what is it? And she opened this box because we raised this two thousand or twenty one hundred dollars. So that was in addition to what the truck show raised. So you know, when it's all said and done, we raised thirty three thousand and eighty five dollars to donate to them, and that's pretty cool. You know, make that donation, of course, you know, in honor of my wife and her battle. 
you know, the truck show it was a truck show to a lot of people, but to me, it was a celebration of her beating breast cancer and, and staying healthy. You know, went on four years after, so it was really special for us. Yeah, I thought it was successful, very successful. I had fun. I really did. Uh, I say you. I mean, I'm used to that bus. I'm enjoying the bus. <laughs> oh yes, the bus you heard Misty mentioned there. Tony talks a little more about the provenance of the 2002 Prevost the pair are now utilizing for Tony's music work. But suffice it to say, they were in Nashville for, uh, for another reason, too. The bus is now outfitted with a custom-designed wrap by the folks at the School of Rap, that's W-R-A-P, on Spence Lane. Pull the horn if you pass the justice on the road in it, you can't miss it. Catch some pictures of the coach coming out of the School of Rap garage this past Tuesday in the post that houses this podcast for July 29th, 2022 via overdriveonline.com slash overdrive hyphen radio. I'm working on, work on a tour for next year possibly and putting truck shows uh, well, lists right. together. You think about doing a tour next year? We're talking with a couple of people. Uh, Misty has been entrenched in the uh, Getting truck show information all across the country. I didn't, had no. I knew there was a lot, but dang, oh, there's a lot of truck shows. So you know, we're looking at handpicking uh, 15 truck shows with a couple of sponsors. Uh, if if everything comes together over the winter, we'll when we roll in there, we'll be all self-contained, stage lights, sound. We'll have, it'll be the whole show. And hopefully, we do it in a way uh, to where the, uh, the show promoters it doesn't cost them anything. And, uh, so all these truck shows are awesome because they're raising money for a lot of great. Special needs of like breast cancer or, you know, uh, Special Olympics, Children's Hospitals. There's so many truck shows or autism, you know, that raise. I wish someone would take the time and figure out how much money that the industry raises for these charities uh, in a year's time. It's got to be off the chain. Yeah. So we're wanting to, you know, roll into these shows at no expense to the show promoters. Right. Uh, in return, our sponsors get to be on the list of sponsors for the show. And, uh, and we roll in there and just. The boys talked about wanting to do our own stage with a little pyro and a big truck in the background. So yeah, that's what we're working on, and uh, yeah, and, and the stage will be there for the for the entire show. So if they have other acts, other things going on, they have use of that stage. So yeah. it's going to save shows a lot of money. That are you know yeah. you're looking at probably a ten to fourteen thousand dollar production just the stage, the sound, and lights. So uh, that's money that they won't have to spend. And uh, it's just one of those deals where everybody involved benefits, uh, the sponsors benefit. Because you know they're getting their their name and brand on all that on existing shows shows that have been around a long time that are proven successful right. instead of trying to having to build one. So they get you know all that PR out of it. They get a place to you know, set up the booth, have people there if they want to. You know right. uh, whether it's if the trucking company, if it's recruiters, and you know put a truck out, you know people to see. So it works great for them. Uh, Promoter saves money, and I I get to do what I like to do and get paid what I need to be paid, and the sponsors are covering my costs. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. That would be a, a really good deal if we pulled it off for everybody involved. And usually those deals kind of take off. Are you are you working on your record? Um, um, that might be coming out before that happens. Right, so we're just really planning about here. We've got plans yeah. to be in the studio hopefully over the winter January okay. February. We got two more videos we want to release off this new album. We're finishing. We just finished. Filming Life on 18 Wheels video yesterday. Sure. Uh, so now we got to wait to get it edited. And uh, hopefully we release that in August, toward the end of August. Sure. And then uh, we'd like to release one more right before the holidays, maybe. Uh, we're looking at Broke Down Beer Truck. What, so, tell me about this bus. It's the coolest thing ever, you we know. We need to pick it up tomorrow. <laughs> you know, a lot of the buzz going around is Tony's hung up his keys. That's what I deal with. Uh, really? People are saying that, huh? Yeah, it, it's probably the way that I worded my post. Uh, I went back and read it and edited it, so that didn't sound right. But you know, basically what we're doing, you know, I, I was driving full-time, yep. working on my music part-time. Yep. And uh, right before Matt's, a few weeks leading up to Matt's, yeah. we just had a lot of things happen that it's just almost like I was being shoved. Yeah, really? Yeah, I mean, you know, we wasn't, we couldn't afford a bus. Tour bus was not even on our radar. And then, you know, through a friend, uh, through a friend, a friend and a phone call, an unplanned phone call, a conversation come up. And his boss had bought a, a new bus. Sure. They still had his the 2002 Prevos, you know, and 
today that thing's just sitting around, you know, and Ed, Ed Evans, the Evans, Ed, Evans Family Ranch out of New Carlisle, Ohio, Ed and Dee Evans are amazing people. They've been hiring us to play their uh, uh, Fourth of July celebration last, this year made three years in a row. So we've, okay. we've become really good friends with them and uh, they're big supporters of me and my music and want us to be successful. And the conversation just come up next thing I know we were talking about, well, maybe, you know, you just take that bus and use it. And uh, wow. I was like, well, I said, that's, if you lease that bus, that's ten, fifteen thousand $15,000 a month bus lease, you know, so we can't afford that. And he said, well, I ain't going to charge you that much, you know. I was like, if you charge me anything, it's probably going to be too much, you know. <laughs> right, right. And he goes, well, how about 2000 a month? And I was like, oh, man, that's, that's a good deal. But when you had operation costs on top of that, we still couldn't afford it, you know. So I put a call in to Hattie Jane with DPA for Generation. I was like, hey, we've had this little offer. I don't know if you're interested or not. And I didn't even get through the story. She's like, I'll do it. I'll pay it. I'll pay the 2000 a month, you know. And then, so the bus, we have nothing in it. I mean, it's not cost to be a penny, but you had this operation cost. So we bring the bus home, we get ready for a show, and, and we have fuel on my yard. And the, my boss says, yeah, you can fuel the bus up here, so it's usually cheap, a little cheaper than what it is at the truck stop. So I pull around there, and I'm filling it up. And uh, just about the time the fuel pump clicked off and it was full, and it held like, I think it was like 142 gallons or something. And it was like 700 something dollars and I think fuel then was like 460 an hour and the uh, boss man walked around the front of the bus by the time I held it he grabbed the shit out of my hand he looked at it and goes how much was it how much did it hold you know and I told him and he just filled up the seat put it in his pocket and he's been paying for every show he's been sponsoring my fuel and he's keeping my my insurance going as if I'm working on mine and her insurance so chain of events I just feel like, you know, someone's telling me it's time to do this a little more serious. So we're doing the music full time and trucking part time now. And I'm in a situation with my boss at ETI that allows me to do that, which they're responsible for so much of this being where, where yeah, it is, kidding. you know, over the years. It's a good thing, though, that you have that kind of experience because he's got that long bus and then that merchandise trailer. That's a, how long is it? Is it as long as a big we're 67 trailer. feet with the 20 foot merchandise on the back of a 45 foot bus. So, yeah, all the, all the years of trucking definitely yeah. come in handy. What's weird is that my tractor now is longer than my trailer. So, when you make a turn, it's, <laughs> it's a little weird. Yeah, so it's, <laughs> the trailer is what's short to the tractor, and the tractor is what's long. Yeah, so, so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's different, but man, that thing drives like a dream, and we're so blessed. Uh, Thanks, Tony. And say, I hope you're all enjoying the new theme for Overdrive Radio. It's a song some of you may recognize, the product of a man who's been indispensable for our audio work here for a long time now, Mr. Long Haul Paul Marhofer. It's Legend of the Snake Man, a reference to the gentleman doing the guitar work on the track, Travis the Snake Man himself, Wemmick who laid down that guitar work at Muscle Shoals Music Marketing, studio of Donnie and Jan Gullett in Tuscumbia, Alabama, where the track was recorded. On the bass, that's Terry Two Socks Richardson with Tishomingo Jim Whitehead on the keyboards, and on drums, Mr. Andrew Marshall. We'll close today's edition of Overdrive Radio with Long Haul Paul himself, whose moving eulogy for longtime trucker Ken Shoestring Wah hit the Over the Road podcast feed last week. The co-production of Overdrive and the folks at PRX's Radiotopia Network has been on hiatus with a few updates since its main eight-episode run in 2020, but the gang gets back together time to time when the occasion demands. Shoestring Wah was among those featured in episode 7 of the podcast and Paul's long haul of fame, and Marhofer offered these recollections of his life. Cut too short, that's sure. This is an over-the-road special. It's hard to believe it was more than two years ago that our journey here at Over the Road began. Some days, though, it feels like it may have well been just yesterday. It embarrasses me a bit to say this, but from time to time, I actually still listen to those episodes. 
I suppose it's because they represent something I never really could have created by myself. And listening reconnects me to my colleagues from Radiotopia and Overdrive magazine. Julie, Lacey, Audrey, Todd, and Ian. Maybe it's because the episodes have a way of putting me back in that pre-COVID state of mind before everyone just flat went reptile. It's kind of like watching the Andy Griffith show with the sound turned down. Pure escapism. Yet there are other reasons, especially of late with episode 7, Long Haul Paul's Hall of Fame. That's the one where we featured some of my own heroes, mentors, and friends. Also, it helps me remember someone we recently lost, the old storyteller himself, Ken Shoestring Wall. Listening to Ken recount the tales of his wilder days as a trucker always had a way of quieting down my caffeine-contorted mind. I suppose he and I got along so well because we were both afflicted by the same ailment. Steinbeck described it as anywhere but here. For guys like us, trucking was just a means to an end. It didn't really matter so much what kind of truck you drove, just as long as you were going somewhere, anywhere but here. He was that guy who would volunteer for the run to El Paso that would find him a thousand miles from home on Christmas morning. Or you might get a call from him the day after Thanksgiving. He'd be boondocking out and his old Freightliner right there in the parking lot of the Laredo Walmart, waiting for his load to cross the border so he could take it north. He would speak in awe of the young, beautiful families he saw shopping. There was no mention of having just missed a holiday. An undying sense of wonder in the most mundane of circumstances was Shoestring's superpower. March 12th would have been the 100th birthday of beat writer Jack Kerouac. In recent weeks, I found myself listening to parts of the audiobook version of Kerouac's On the Road while I've been out in the truck and wondering just who Kerouac's sidekick, Dean Moriarty, really was. It just takes a little YouTubing around to discover that Moriarty's character in the book was based on an actual reform school graduate would eventually become not only Kerouac's running buddy, but the muse for both the beat generation of the 50s and the counterculture of the 60s. His name was Neil Cassidy, as many of you may know. There's footage of Cassidy online, twitching around, rapping nonstop, gesticulating wildly. All I could think was, oh my gosh, he looks just like half the truckers we used to know at the Pompano Farmer's Market. I reach for the phone. Shoestring has got to get a load of this. Then my head catches up with my heart, and I remember the thing I forgot. Shoestring's last month here were difficult. He was in Brazil, Indiana, on his 10-hour break back in July when he got the call. His son Mikey, then five years clean and sober, had relapsed. An autopsy would reveal that his first fix out of the gate was pure fentanyl. He was 40. Shoestring had been so proud of the boy. He had come so far. A few days after he got the news, we talked at length. He hoped we could write a song to memorialize his son. So we did. Just a few months after I sent Shoestring a scratch demo of the song, he was trucking over Mount Sherman in Wyoming and developed a blood clot. By the time he made it home, He was in really bad shape. He stabilized, but a few weeks later, his beautiful wife, Melissa, sent us a message. Shoestring was back in the hospital and had asked to see me. By some fluke, I was in town that day. When my wife, Denise, and I got there, his hands and feet were so badly swollen he could barely speak. He told me to get out of trucking before it killed me like it was killing him. He told me I had a gift that he never had. He had been a troubadour in his early years and was scratching out a living at it. He toured the Holiday Inn circuit for a while, had an agent and a roadie, the whole nine yards. He still played out every now and then, 
I had seen him perform and strongly disagreed with his assessment of his own talents versus mine. But none of that mattered now. The next day, he was gone. I did try to honor his request, though. So I'm trucking a little less now. I'm going to be playing a few more shows, writing a few more articles for Overdrive magazine, and getting to know my own family a little more while my health is still fairly good. It really is the great American conflation, you know? Freedom in motion. It's been etched into our national psyche by a veritable canon of stories and songs. They all tell you if you're not going somewhere, you're missing out. After wandering to and fro across this country for now around four million miles, I'm beginning to wonder whether running constantly makes anyone free. It makes for a great song, but all I'm really asking of the universe these days is to have the time to teach my grandson how to change a flat tire. I'd like to have a garden that isn't overtaken by weeds by the 4th of July, and maybe even darken the door of our little small town church more than twice a year. I spoke with Shoestring's widow, Melissa, for the first time since his memorial just a few days ago. She told me that shortly before he died, he bequeathed to me his guitar. So, this is the song Shoestring and I wrote for his son. May his sense of wonder never leave us.
For to this dust I shall be wed Hold me mama Hold my weary head For to this dust and waves but I'll be alright I'll be alright it comes in waves it comes in waves but I'll be alright Overdrive Radio is a production of Overdrive, the voice of the American trucker. It's edited and produced by me, Todd Dills, with the acoustic guitar and other support, truck songwriter and Overdrive contributor, Long Haul Paul Marhofer. The theme is Legend of the Snake Man by Marhofer, featuring the guitar work of Travis the Snake Man himself, Womack, Terry Two Socks Richardson on bass, keys by Tishmingo Jim Whitehead, and on drums, Mr. Andrew Marshall. The podcast is backed up further by Overdrive's own news editor, Matt Cole, social media coordinator, Holly Young, and executive editor, Alex Lyon. Until next time, keep it rolling.